Hello, and welcome to the Mick Plus One podcast, where I sit down with industry leaders to discuss the project to product movement. I'm Mick Kirsten, founder and CEO of Tastop and best selling author of Project to Product How to Survive and Thrive in the Age of Digital Disruption with a Flow Framework. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Adrian Cockcroft, VP of Cloud Architecture Strategy at Amazon Web Services. Adrian Cockcroft has led an amazing career at the leading edge of cloud technology. In his role at AWS, he's focused on the needs of cloud native and all in customers. Prior to AWS, Adrian started out as a developer in the UK, then moved to the US and became a distinguished engineer at Sun Microsystems. He was a founding member of eBay Research Labs and started at Netflix in 2007, becoming their, their cloud architect and helping teams scale and migrate to AWS. As Netflix shared its architecture publicly, Adrian became a regular speaker at conferences and executive summits, and he created and led the Netflix open source program. In 2014, he joined VC firm Battery Ventures, promoting new ideas around DevOps, microservices, cloud, and containers, and moved into his current role at AWS in October 2016. Adrian holds a degree in applied physics from the City University of London and is a published author of four books. We covered a ton of ground in this episode, so with that, let's get right to it. Hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to have Adrian Cockcroft here with us today. In Project to Product, I talked a lot about just how good tech giants are getting in terms of aligning their product value streams, their software architecture, and their organizational structure to innovate at a pace that, that we've never seen before. And I think the really amazing thing about Adrian is he's actually been a key part in how some of those tech giants and those fangs have actually gotten to this place in terms of bringing the benefits of cloud-native delivery right to their business models and to their feedback loops. So I'm just thrilled to learn for us to learn some about your journey, Adrian, and about how that journey is actually now impacting the way other organizations are to operate in this new modern mindset and these new feedback loops as they figure out how to move to cloud native and get some of these benefits that we're seeing in the tech giants into their own organizations. Of course, leveraging a lot of the services that are now available out there in the cloud solutions, but especially in changing how they think and how they plan and how they operate from a business and a strategy and an economic perspective. So with that, welcome. And it's been great to see how this, this notion of product rather than project-centric innovation has actually been helping pave the path for some of these organizations. So if you could say, tell us a bit about that, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Thanks. And thanks for having me on the podcast. Yeah, when I was talking about this whole idea of particularly the sort of product mindset and then your book came out and it became much easier. I just pointed people at the book and then said, you know, you probably need to get rid of 90% of your project managers. And that's the reason why you can't get anywhere. And I go around telling customers about talking to customers about it. And that's most of my job right now is trying to help customers innovate faster. And I talk to a mixture. I may talk to everybody. And some of it is, you know, old organizations that are trying to modernize. But I concentrate particularly on some of the, I know there's, you come up with various names for it. Scaled digital native is another interesting term, like a Netflix or Uber or companies like that. And then there are the companies that have managed to get themselves into, into that state or closer into that state. So there's been interesting discussions. And what I found is that uh, if I start talking about project to product, if I get a blank stare, I know where I am at one end of the spectrum. And at the other end of the spectrum, somebody said, oh, yeah, Mick was here last week, right? So, okay, I know exactly where you are now. So we can have a very different conversation starting from that point. So I quite often use, use it as a test at the beginning of a conversation. Have you, figured, have you figured this out yet? And it's a good way to sort of discriminate almost a maturity model for are you still using projects and wondering why you're not getting anywhere and everything's so slow and the people slowing you down and preventing all the change happening are the project managers because they see projects going away and they, it's there, they are there to manage projects, right? So this is kind of a circular problem you have. Anyway, that's been a good place for me to start many of the conversations with people because what we've found is when you've got an organization that's broken into smaller pieces and each piece owns a different piece of the product and you've got a product team mentality, you're able to just iterate and, and get things going at the speed you need to go at nowadays to be competitive. Yeah, and I think, like you said, it's, it's a bit circular because I've noticed that when I'm talking to senior leaders in an in organization, the maturity in terms of their cloud mindset and the benefits they perceive on cloud versus thinking, you know, this, this will just be too expensive to move away from our data center or some of the backwards thinking that I think we still tend to see 
that actually tells me how ready they are also for the for a product oriented model in terms of steering their organization, their innovation and, and their value streams. So I think these two things, I think we've both noticed they go hand in hand since products are the vehicles by which we can deliver faster, deliver more quickly to a customer, right? You have to have a notion of customer, you have to value the pace and speed of delivery. And to do that at scale, I think, you know, we need to learn some of the, the lessons that you, you've you've learned that you've established in organizations that, that are the scale digital natives. So if you could tell us a bit about some of that, because I think, again, the to me, the fascinating thing is that when technical practices change organizational models, you know, do the things that, you know, I've talked about before, like reversing Conway's law. And what I've noticed is that these, these two things go hand in hand, right? Uh, product, portfolio, structure, and identified notion of value streams with a technical architecture based on cloud and microservices and modern modern architectures and frameworks that can actually deliver on those innovations, right? Because if you're missing one or the other, and this has been an interesting thing where an organization will actually start moving to cloud, but still be completely project-oriented in how they ma- manage and fund and measure delivery. So if you could just r- rewind a little bit, because again, I think you've helped establish those technical practices in organizations like Netflix, and then really have those become the modern set of business practices for helping these scaled digital natives take more and more of the market. So can you tell us some of your sort of early lessons learned and how did these businesses really adapt to what was possible in terms of the pace and speed of deployment and then how that factored into basically the the business feedback loop? Yeah, I think it's just, uh, I mean, in 2004, I joined eBay because it came out of some microsystems and I ended up at eBay. And eBay was on a two-week release cycle. You called it a train model, and you got on the train, and the train left. And if your feature wasn't on the train, it caught the next one, right? So, you know, for me, that was a reasonably fast cycle. That was an interesting one. And they put that in place in order to get feature velocity and not have things dragging out. And it put everything on a very managed process. It was very centrally managed. So that was an interesting experience. Learned a lot there. And... The other thing at eBay, it was all horizontally scaled. So the system was designed to scale because they didn't know how big they needed to be in the future very well. And so they kept running out of capacity. And I'd helped them earlier on with some capacity planning, consulting effectively when I was still at Sun. So that was how I knew the people there, how I ended up there. Then after a few years, I went to Netflix. And Netflix at the time was running a very small system that was basically doing DVD shipping under websites. You could pick your next DVD. And what they needed was to be able to scale for streaming. And they saw that coming. And they also wanted better, you know, they were basically, they recruited a few people from from eBay, from Google, from Yahoo at the time, and formed a team of experienced people who knew how to do stuff at scale. And it was a very senior team. This is this is not a bunch of young kids figuring stuff out. Netflix are biases to very senior people who have seen everything many times before. As the team got bigger, it got harder and harder to jam everything into this monolith we release we were releasing every two weeks. It was basically the same model, the same stack. It was a Java Oracle two-week release cycle. And this is a top-down thing. Reed basically said, we don't know how big we need to be. We're not going to have time to build data centers fast enough to respond to the capacity that we may need, looking at how big this could be and how quickly we could need capacity. And part of this, it wasn't that we were growing customers for streaming. We were converting customers from DVD to streaming. And when they converted, they used, say, a thousand times more data center resources to stream for the same customer. So I had a graph one sec. When, when a tenth of a percent of Netflix's customer base was streaming, half the data center was managing streaming and the other half was doing DVD. That's what a thousand X means. And so we could see that happening and we were worried we were gonna run out of capacity. And then the other thing, Netflix is a small company running around trying to compete with YouTube, you know, iTunes and Apple, Comcast and all the other TV companies and all the cable companies and and was surrounded by competitors that wanted to take us out, Blockbuster, all those kinds of things. And the thing that we could do is be incredibly agile. So the survival plan that Reed has was extremely fast. The whole company optimized around being more agile, more able to innovate than the competition. And then we wanted a platform that would scale into the future. But to be arbitrarily large, we didn't know 
at the time we had like five, 10 million customers. We didn't know whether we would be at 50 million or 100 million or whatever. They're now a few hundred million end users and like 150 million customers or something. We built something to scale. And we were all already organized in small teams. So we didn't have to do a reorg. But those teams were building artifacts like jar files, which were then being mashed together by QA into a release. And that was the bit that was difficult. So we said, let's take that step out and release these jar files as as services, build an API around them. And that was kind of the, we call it service or fine grain SOA was Mm -hmm. what we called it. And then the word microservices came along and said, okay, let's all adopt that word and use it to mean the same thing. So it came as an outgrowth of two things. One was agility and the other one was scalability for a very fast growing workload. So people sort of say, well, not everyone can be Netflix, but if you've got those two problems, then this is a good architecture. If you have other problems, then maybe there are other architectures, but so don't over apply. But if those are the two problems you're solving for, you can learn a lot from the Netflix architectural models that we built around that. And that's the part that's so fascinating to me is that 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 whole architecture, which really, you know, really was where, at least for me, for me, when I was watching this happen and working still in jar files a lot, you know, it drove what we've got with sort of modern SOA, then APIs and, and microservices. And the fact that it actually came from a business agility need, because what I'm hearing so often right now is there's, you know, there's complaints around our, our business is not agile enough. We can't adapt fast enough. That startup is moving so much faster than we are without any appreciation of the importance of, of architecture and the ability to deploy and manage dependencies in this way as you know, really the infrastructure that you need for that kind of business agility. So I guess in terms of what you've seen, and, but then I think we've seen some positive signs as well. It's, I think there's still too few and far between. But you, know, you recently published this, this great pithy post on cloud native cost optimization where we are actually seeing some organizations start thinking in this way. And I've seen some limited cases of, this is, you know, this is related to COVID, I think, of the way that some of the newer digital platforms are being invested in at these organizations are actually starting to take this into account, that for the agility of a new digital platform that you bring to market because your old cash cow is no longer viable, you're now starting to, to set up the right kinds of architectures and, and to, go, you know, to go all in on cloud for the purpose of, of business agility. So Adrian, how do, you, how do you address this though? Because we've got these, and a lot of the people who are listening have these massive monoliths that are composed of thousands of jar files and release management processes that may, would make anyone want to cry and that people you know, involved in them often do. So I shouldn't be joking about that, but these are, we've, we're dealing with a lot of legacy. How do you, how do you help I think in the end with, with the goal being the business agility that's needed now more than ever to survive and, and, and re, for the, a lot of these companies to rebuild in a way that's meaningful for the digital services that the economy is going to be consuming increasingly over the years. How do you help them think the right way about investing in those aspects of their architecture? Because so often I see that, again, there's just a large misunderstanding of the thing that was back then so clear to you and to read. Yeah, I want to go back to two things which are part of the architecture, which just sort of act as a kind of step up to giving me some underpinnings for for answering that question. Two associated things. It wasn't just microservices, right? There was another thing, which was if you take your monolith and you break it into lots of little services, and then you connect them all to the same SQL database, and then you do, you know, you take it offline to do your alter table every once a week, then your, and your schema is coupling everything. So now you've built a distributed monolith and that's another anti-pattern. So at the same time, we also learned to move from, to denormalize our architecture, our data model for the online. I'm talking purely about the online, the thing which it has to be up for Netflix to be up, that piece of the system. There's many other parts of Netflix which have different characteristics, but the online services, we went to a NoSQL model at the time, you used Cassandra. Nowadays, you'd use DynamoDB or there's various other models. But you basically, the problem we had was if you have one database and you have a relational schema, changing that schema is an invasive change, whereas the NoSQL are, are schemaless or they're flexible schema. You can score different shaped objects in there without having to restart things. Now, you then have to manage consistency yourself, and you've got to manage all those relations. So there's, an, there's more work to be done. But what that does is it unlocks the ability to innovate independently across the system. 
So that was one piece of additional architectural unblocking that let us get there. The other thing, and this is, I don't think people really quite understand everything about this, but we, we'll go back to the Chaos Monkey, which is kind of a famous little thing. It was, a, it, what it went, is it deleted machines? And people thought it was crazy. Why would you go around deleting machines? But what they didn't, the, the other part they didn't realize was everything we had was in an autoscaler group. Like the architecture was that everything will be an autoscale group. Like the, the only way that Netflix prod deployed was to deploy an autoscale group with, an, with a machine image. And then it would make N copies of whatever. And N could be one. But typically, it was a minimum of three. You know, we had three zones. So we typically we'd run six as the minimum size, minimum number of entities for a for a microservice. And the point about an order scale group, we started off hand managing them. You created an order scale group, and you know, if you needed more, you'd turn it up. But we wanted to order scale dynamically, which means you have to be able to scale down, and to scale down, you have to be able to kill a machine. So you can actually think of the chaos monkey as the design control for the ability to scale down, and, right? And so every, night, every day, the number of API servers or whatever goes scales up, and every evening it scales back down again. And as it scales down, it's just killing machines. It doesn't need to drain work out of them. It doesn't need to worry about losing state. It knows that at any point in time, you can kill a machine, and you don't have to think about it because somewhere higher up, there'll be a retry new user won't even notice there's a very short additional latency for anything that was in flight and it's all item potent requests and these stateless systems so the chaos monkey is actually enforcing that design and that gives you elasticity and that lets you run very high efficiencies this is how we get to the efficiency in the business agility because now you can say i have just the number just enough machines to run the workload now and in some number of minutes, I can make it to a different number of machines. So as long as I can track the required load with a feedback loop measured in a few minutes, I can scale up and down. And they actually ended up building a predictive model because some of the instances took too long to initialize. So, Oh, so they up. would spin them up proactively? Yeah, some of the servers took like 10. We were huge Tomcat servers with 60 gigabyte heaps and yeah. Microservices, they do one thing, but they're really big. <laughs> um, the micro wasn't about the size of the service. It was about it was written by one person, probably, you know, one to two people, and it was it did one thing. That was the idea, right? But the ability to, you know, so we, they built a forward prediction model which would yeah. um, say how many machines are we going to need in an, in half an hour and an hour, and it would pre pre-create them. So then you get to the business agility of well, what do you need on a Wednesday night? What do you need on a Saturday morning? What do you need if uh, it's Super Bowl and you're doing something that's got extra activity because your people are interacting with you or your business all went away during Super Bowl because everyone's not stopped watching Netflix and they're watching the, the game, right? So we used to see the business basically disappear during large sporting events, but then come back as soon as the final whistle went. So you'd get a, like, almost like a vertical line on the graph as soon as the game ended, as everyone went back to watching Netflix. So there's an um, extreme ability to have a very, whatever utilization you want in the system. And really, if you're trying to get good economics in cloud, I'd concentrate on utilization and I'd measure it everywhere. I'd measure the actual utilization of your services and full you know, cradle to grave from when you first launch an instance to when it shuts down not just when it's supposed to be busy. And that's kind of do the same thing for data centers. There's lots of idle machines in data centers. Okay, so this is, I think you touched on a key thing at the very start of that, which is that your, your data architecture is, you know, I, I was talking briefly about the, the software architecture and the, and the microservices, but the, what you learned back then in Netflix was a key aspect of the data architecture was to allow different parts of the, of the organization to move independently, right? And mm -hmm. of course, I think a lot of, we've got a lot of fans of schemaless architectures. I know certainly that's everything I've been doing as well lately because it allows that separation of what different product value streams can do and that decoupling of having some of these intertwined dependencies, as you just stated, is that that independence allows a faster pace of innovation. And it so also creates a whole lot of problems. <laughs> and it was the hardest thing we did. 
Just retraining all our developers to not think in terms of, you know, hibernating their SQL yeah. and all that stuff and to get into a NoSQL model and not need transactions, not need joins. And it was a major pain in the neck. And I think that was the single hardest thing that we worked through. But what it unlocked was the ability to move much faster and scale much better. Yeah, and I know when our organization did the same thing, it was it was a massive switch as well. So again, I guess it was just another, you know, similar to investment of, in, to go into cloud native, this this investment in a data architecture that allows that that independence, I guess you're saying is key to moving faster and to increasing that. It, it is too. And then the other thing that is also not understood well is how you manage versions. The way that eBay did it, the way Netflix did it in the early days with the monolith was you'd stop the monolith and start a new one, mm -hmm. or you'd roll, you'd have a, a rollover where you'd quickly replace your fleet of old machines with new machines as quickly as you could, because it wouldn't work quite right in the middle. And the day before you would bounce the database to put in the new schemas that the new machines would want, right? That was the old way of doing it. If you've got a schemaless data model, you can have different versions of things. You know, the new version can mm -hmm. write a new version of that, so that object. So then you have to do it in a way that the old version doesn't blow up when it sees an object that's slightly different. So that, again, is important flexibility. And the new version has to do the right thing when it sees an old version or an object. So that is, again, it's hard and it's more work. It's something you can test. But what that gives you then is the ability to run as many versions of the same, the, pick one microservice. I can run as many versions of that microservice as I need to in production. And I can always introduce a new one at any time without disrupting the system because most of the traffic is going to the older versions. And the only traffic that touches my new version is an A-B test or a feature flagged thing which I can turn on and off and see if it works. So I can basically do testing in production. If it looks like it meets the new need, I can leave it up. If it also is completely compatible with the previous version, then I can transfer all the traffic onto it. If it happens to be meet the new need, but not be completely compatible for some reason, I can leave it as a separate version and just route the mm -hmm. test data, to the, the A-B test part traffic to it. And if it turns out there's problems with the A-B test, you can turn it off. So you've got to fall back to the old version always available in the routing, in the microservice routing. And this ability to do version-aware routing is a key part of how we got that agility. So then you get the problem that they have N versions running and you've got to clean them up sometime. So you've got to go through this garbage collection. So think of it as the way memory works. If mm -hmm. I want some new memory, I get the memory now. If I want a new version of a microservice, I should be able to deploy it now. And then later on, I do some cleanup and I compact the old versions and I move some things around and eventually there's no traffic to some old version that has to see it so I can shut that down. Yeah. So we used to schedule like a quarterly cleanup, um, breaking the build. We used to put like a find bugs rule to say this version, you can't build against this version right. of the library anymore. There was a conformity monkey, which would basically complain about any old versions of things that were running. And, and we'd dep deprecate all the machine images that would let you start a new one. So basically, they would break your build and you'd have to go deal with it before you could move on. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, and yeah, I think that's the build with that. At, at one point, the deprecated version just, just find bugs as a produces an error and yeah. The pipe, yeah. your build stops working and yeah. yeah. And you, you schedule these cleanup sessions for when there's nothing sort of critical happening yeah. in terms of the product release cycles. Right. But yeah. that model of treating it as decoupling the introduction of new features from the major traffic that's flowing through the system gives you extreme stability because most of the traffic is going through a really well beaten path. It is very stable and you're able to innovate in all kinds of ways with all kinds of really pretty broken code, quite likely. You can, you can throw code out there that is barely working in production and have no impact on almost all the customers, right? Because it's only the customers in the test cell, mm -hmm. which is initially the product manager and the QA person, right. and the engineer that built it probably, you know, those sorts of people. But you're testing in production. Where you're at and what you know what Amazon's been doing, this this is basically I think there's a very what, what you've been communicating in, in your presentations on Medium and elsewhere, you've been painting this very clear picture of what good and great looks like today. And a lot of organizations still have a, a very long way to go. And I, what I really like about our, our previous conversation is when you talked about how 
investing in this is so critical. It's actually now known how to do it. When you were doing it before, you were defining the practices. You were defining, you were still, I'm sure there were debates whether Schema Less was good or bad, given how hard that switchover was for the first set of organizations like yours that, that did it. So in terms of the business and economic framing for this is that, that you said that when you've got this in place, it actually creates this, this amazing feedback for your OODA loop. So this is kind of a necessary condition to have fast feedback when delivering, when delivering software. And then that feedback loop, and I think the amazing thing is that companies that we see do this, and we see companies like Amazon do it at, at a massive scale of products, right? Netflix at a, a more narrow scale. Can you just talk a bit about how you think about that and how this, again, is about bringing data for decision-making back into the business? Yeah, I used to have a presentation where I I put up an OODA loop diagram and talk about it for a long time. So I'll do sort of the verbal version of that. Yeah, please. So uh, OODA loops, it's it's a nice model for this for for two reasons. One is it's the observe, orient, decide, act sort of loop for feedback. But it came out of dogfighting in um, Boyd and the Korean War and in an aircraft that was more agile, you could take out somebody that had better firepower. That's the model. And that was why Netflix was kind of, Netflix was more agile and everyone else had more firepower. This is the old Netflix when Netflix was a tiny company worried about getting bored or taken out. Now it's too big to get for that. You know, it, it managed to outgrow that problem. So the, the four stages, the first thing is, can you see what to do? This is the observe piece. And this comes down a lot to company culture. Do people naturally form hypotheses in the company without getting shot down for being stupid or whatever or bringing bad news or whatever, right? You've got to have a learning culture where people are open to all kinds of suggestions and ideas from everywhere in the organization. It isn't a research team's job to come up with the new ideas. It's everybody's job to come up with the new ideas and to see how to incrementally improve whatever they're doing. So that's the observe piece. Like, what do you observe could be better, right? The orient part is where data science comes in. It's like, okay, I'm going to do some research. I'm going to quickly answer a question that I've never asked before, that's never been asked before. And that's what a data lake or a data science or gathering the data. So you have to be able to have the data in a form where you can gather it and query it and hopefully have enough clean data there that you can hone your hypothesis and direct it to something and come up with say, okay, now I have a testable hypothesis because I know what the data currently looks like. The next stage is in the UDA, observe, orient, decide, act. So decide is basically you know, building the thing and deciding to build it. And who gives the approvals for your ability to deploy something to production? And if your deploy to production is every six months and it's like hundreds of features jammed into a monolith, it's a big deal. And every little thing that might destabilize that is a problem. If what you're doing is 10 deploys a day per team, and it's a microservice and you can create a new version that doesn't impact anyone else, anybody can change anything without having to consult across the company safely. So it's still, it's a very safe, low risk thing to do, right? So you're building in the ability to make lots of tiny changes and do it safely with that, with minimum coordination. And then the act part is where cloud really comes in because you need API driven. You don't want to file tickets and wait. Some things you need a security review, right? And if you look at the way AWS develops, everything is incredibly fast until we get to security review and then we come to a like screeching halt and wait for the security people to bless it, right? The security is job one, we have to be secure. So we use that as a gate and it actually slows down a lot of what we do, but we take that slowness because we need the safety. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of businesses which have a safety critical in, or security critical in some manner. You've still got to have some gates for some things. But you do as much as you can without having to invoke that, that, that security gate, right? So then you go through, you've deployed it, you've done your act part, and then you get to watch what happens. And the whole point about the dogfight is that if you're in a competitive market and you're looping faster than your competitors, then you get to disorientate them and you get to react to the market, you get to learn more about the customer, learn more about the market, learn about what your competitors are trying to do, and to destabilize or or just just out-execute people. And that's the advantage. That's why CEOs are now asking their CIOs, you're doing microservices, right? Because we're too slow, and that's how you speed stuff up. And that's kind of the why it came into that story as a kind of a shorthand for doing everything at a faster pace. 
right? And then what it really comes down to, we talked about this earlier as well, is time to value is how I'd measure things. And you, you were calling it flow time, right? So how quickly can you have an idea, change a customer, affect a customer with that idea, right? Yeah. That is the time. That's the idea to the value. And there's way too much work in progress if you're going slowly. And there's lots of unfinished things that are taking too long. So you want to break everything into tiny chunks, tiny chunks of work. Yeah. And Adrian, I wanted like this two really key things I think that I want to dig on a little bit more. So this, this notion of time to value, right? So in your cloud for CEOs, the book you, pub- book you published, that you call this latency and time to value as just the number one metric that needs to be that needs to be focused on. And in the flow framework, it's, it's, it's just flow time, exactly the same concept. Can, can you just say a bit about why you think it's that powerful that if there's going to be only one metric a CEO focuses on, it's this one? Yeah, it's a booklet. It's only got nine pages. It's a kind of a glossy white paper because the idea being that CEOs are busy and they only have five minutes to read something. So you can find it if you just, if you Google Cloud for CEOs, Cockroft, it'll come up. There's, it was published last October. Um, there's a blog post about it in the Enterprise blog on AWS. And it's just a free download. You don't have to sign it. You just click and you get it. It's a little PDF. And we've been handing this thing out like candy at various events and things because it's, it's kind of nicely written. I think we have... This year, we were working on translating it even because it's, it's a nice summary. It basically is the distillation of an hour-long talk that I gave at reInvent last year on speeding up development or speeding up innovation. And I've been working on that for about a year, and I sort of distilled it down into a set of ideas. And what it came down to was if you have short time to value, then you have to be breaking things into small pieces. So that's good. You have to be... It basically forces all of the other metrics into the right place. It means that you could, you've got very little work in progress. You've got very little waste in the system. You're iterating quickly. You're able to respond quickly. You've got high flow from sort of Doug Reinertsen sort of principles of product flow. You're, you're, you're aligning with all of those things. And I think that that's the, what you can do if you're a CEO or a CIO is go across your teams and say, what is your actual, how often do you deliver And the stuff that's in this delivery, like you're delivering every three months, okay? That doesn't mean your time to value is three months because the thing that's in that three-month release was probably written nine months ago. Mm -hmm. And everyone's written code that never reached production because the project was canceled or there was a reorg or person left or something, right? There's lots, so much wasted work because the thing you're delivering into is a future vehicle that may never happen, right? Was if you, if at the end of every day, you wrap up your coding for that day and that code goes and delivers to production automatically when you check it in, you know, many times a day or, you know, at least once a day is a nice cycle, right? Your work overnight should be deployed to production. You come in the next day, it should either have got kicked back by some automated testing or canary testing that said this was bad, or it should be running in production everywhere. And then somebody else wants to make a change to that system. They see your fresh code from yesterday as their starting point. And this is what's really important. So much reduction in waste by not having branches where branches and having to merge back conflicting changes. That was fundamentally why all of the Netflix code base went back in when it was a monolith. There was a movie object and a customer object, and they were monster objects, and they were just like laden with all kinds of crap. And everybody touched them all the time. And we would just have these massive merge fights to try and figure out how to not break this object and get 10 or 15 people's changes merged into it for a release. And it was just like, no, stop this. That was the, we have to walk away and find a better way. And we created a much more lightweight faceted data type where you could get data out of it, but it didn't have any of the business logic in it. It was just a data, a faceted data source. It's kind of a, we effectively hacked into Java, the sort of, Objects, I forget exactly, I've forgotten the, the phrase for it, but the variable typing kind of thing. With reflection? Yeah, it was done in a very strange way. It was a piece of the Netflix architecture that, that I'm not sure if it really caught on, but it was, we thought it was important at the time. It's either class laws or reflection laws. Do that for you? I've done both, and yeah, it's... Uh... It was a very custom piece of weird code, but yeah, <laughs> at the time. So... I think it's interesting that you mentioned culture because so often I hear leadership blame culture, but the way that you approach culture in Cloud for CEOs is that culture is really about leadership systems and feedback and mm-hmm. this, this OODA loop. 
And then the thing that really blew my mind when we when we last chatted was that leaders, I don't know if it's exactly how you said it, but I've been thinking about it ever since, is that leaders need to think of this OODA loop in terms of this feedback loop in terms of the theory of constraints. The thing that's slowing down your feedback, and again, that's one this one metric. And I just want to mention that everything I've seen in the last 18 months of flow framework and project to product completely backs up that statement in terms of the data, which is that flow time or that latency is the number one thing that leaders need to need to focus on. Because once they reduce that, they will increase that feedback loop. And then, then they can decide, do they need to be more agile here or adopt this framework or increase the talent pool because they don't have enough designers or they've got too many manual processes and testing and so on. But that one notion of flow time can steer that because once that feedback loop is... And, and in the end, actually, this is a great way, obviously, to make the business case for moving more quickly to cloud, because I think to the technologists, it's pretty obvious. To the business, they might still have some legacy thinking that we can really easily break through by focusing on, on that one metric. So can you just say just a little bit more about that, what you're seeing in terms of... Because I think thinking of it, of it in terms of fear of constraints is what is the biggest constraint to you getting fast feedback from your customer from the market so that you can actually get to that thing you're after, which is business agility. Because six to nine months of feedback and learning for your strategy is not definitely not going to cut it. It wasn't really cutting it before and it won't def- it won't cut in a post-pandemic world. So I'd never heard that term yet, the theory of constraints for for the OODA loop. So yeah. I mean it was mostly if you're trying to get a loop and if, you know you've got most of the parts of it going in minutes and one part of it's taking weeks, then you're still at weeks, right? You haven't solved the real problem. So you've got to find the the thing that's actually slowing you down. Is, and it can be in different pieces. Different organizations have different places that are making them slow. And there's sort of two approaches. You can either take, well, okay, so it takes us three months to get a release out. Let's go and look at how many meetings that is, how many tickets are filed, mm-hmm measure those, put them on a whiteboard somewhere, trying to shame people into making those numbers go down, yeah. right? celebrate anyone that manages to improve things. right? So you can kind of socially engineer, this is what the execs care about, we want to simplify stuff. right? That will get you incremental improvements and maybe in a, a little bit later, maybe in a few release cycles time, you're down to two months, which is better. right? But what you should also do is create a fast path. And this is something that came out. I was talking to a bank about this, one of the big global banks, and they said, yeah, we have, I had on my diagram, I said, yeah, it takes forever to get stuff done. It says, but we created a fast path that took two weeks instead of nine months or whatever, their six months, whatever their normal cycle was. And said, if you meet these criteria, it's a simple low risk change, you can go through the fast path. And what this does is it declutters your slow path. Right? It takes out a lot of noise, right. which is actually causing a lot of issues and bugs and delaying the release of things and making it harder to test. So the first thing is to declutter. So the the fundamental releases just focused on the big, hard changes, API changes, breaking changes, schema changes, stuff like that, business process changes. Whereas making a dashboard easier to use and improving usability, all of those kinds of things, all the UX stuff should be in the fast path. Yeah. So you end up with a product that's much easier to use and much more productive for the end users and you're not, you're not, it makes it much easier for them to innovate. It would be better if this button here was a little bit bigger. Sure, no trouble, I can do that, right? Not, oh, that's going to take nine months and it's not yeah. worth doing, right? So those kinds of things I think are important for getting it going. But this bank then said something really interesting happened. One of their teams was quietly working away and then said, hey, we released this big new project, this whole major thing. And they said, and we released every bit of it through the fast path. <laughs> and, just, and, and they said, what? <laughs> yeah, we, we just took all of those big, hairy, complicated changes and we broke them down until they were individually simple enough that they met the criteria to go through the fast path. We didn't cheat. We just didn't tell you we were doing it in advance. We just had this idea that maybe let's see how much we can get through. And they got very, very creative at simplifying and de-risking every little change and making lots and lots of tiny changes. And, you know, the reaction of management was, this is amazing, everyone else figure out how to do that, right? Right. which is the right reaction, not you crazy people, you rolled out a big project without using the correct, correct controls, right? So that was, that was a light bulb for me. I, like, modified my slide and put that story in. And I think that's been a really good piece of advice ever since, is that if you're trying to... I learned this also from, I used to do Six Sigma years ago, 
And Six Sigma said, there's, there's an entitlement to a process. You can tune a process to get better and better. Eventually, it reaches its entitlement. You can't get better. You have to create a complete new, new process from scratch. It is just different. It's radically simpler. It's built on different principles. And then you get to, like, it's changing gear in your car. You're at the rev limiter, right? Yeah. You get to the next gear, and then you can accelerate based on that. So that was kind of a, a new way of looking at how to improve these things and how to speed it up. So you build yourself a little fast do the loop for the lightweight stuff. It's so fascinating because I think a task that we did that had very something happened four years ago, which is that I think we thought we had good processes for delivering features and no one was complaining about the flow time of features, but we increasingly had these, you know, some really large customer had a feature request that had to happen quickly. So we created this new process called a deal-breaking feature request and those features could be done you know, within a sprint and mm -hmm. within a small fraction of a sprint, right? And it was actually that new deal break breaking feature process, which didn't even take that long to mature. But like you said, it had many more automated gates on yep. everything around, you know, quality, security, all of that. And all of a sudden, that became the foundation for our regular process of delivering features rather than trying to, for us to improve that process. So I think, I think that's a great tip for the large enterprise organizations out there is find that fast path because it can really break the thinking of, we, you know, we can't make things go faster. Yeah, well, and, and don't stop there. If you've, if you've moved from months to weeks, once you get that going, have something that's ours, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to need it next time a, a critical, you know, CVE, critical vulnerability appears or whatever, or you get a security patch, you got to yep. stick in there, right? You still need to be able to iterate in hours and do that reliably. Yep. So that's really continuous delivery at that point. And what getting a CI CD pipeline in place is built into automated testing and canary testing and all that kind of stuff, right? That's the, that's where you need to be. Whereas, and then every team, you don't have necessarily have a coordinated sprint across the company. Every team updates whenever they want to. Yeah. And this is sort of going back to the you know, a decade ago at Netflix, every team ran at their own pace. We didn't, we stopped trying to have a synchronized sprint process. Some people ran weekly, some people were just continuous, some people were less frequent. It was whatever they needed and whatever tooling they needed, but we were running on one build system, one delivery pipeline. It's just the updates were batched as whatever was comfortable for that team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think what's so interesting, that I've, and I've heard sort of more maturity around that for incidents and defects and so on, but the fact that your experience and my experience was actually that you can make this work for features. So you don't have that small fix that's sitting there on a backlog for two more release cycles mm -hmm. or longer. You actually are able to fast track that and that, that becomes a new process. And I yeah, think this everything, everything behind a feature flag. Like, this is hypothesis-driven development, feature flags yeah. and canary testing and A-B testing. Like, all of those yeah. things, I'd say, are foundational. And you, you should, I did a little ranty post recently about A-B testing because yes, I, right. I was talking to yet another um, media and entertainment customer who was just thinking about doing A-B testing and going like, okay, you're trying to compete with Netflix and they've been A-B testing for 15, 20 years and you're just starting, really? <laughs> it's, <And> debating? <laughs> you're not competing. You have no way to compete. Like, and I just did like the basics of how we were doing A-B testing like a decade ago like just the fundamental principles of it. And which seemed, I thought this was, would be just well-known standard practice now, and it still isn't really. So I, I didn't, I did a couple of posts on this, but anyway. Yeah, it's a great post. I read that, I read that one as well. So I think, but in, and in the end, this is all, I, again, I, I love this way of thinking of that. What you're trying to do is find the constraint in, in your OODA loop, right? You mentioned Amazon's is security, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's large car manufacturers. It's not that they have no constraints in the production process. Turns out no matter how many volts you put through a steel body of a car, it still takes it some time to dry. And that can be a, a constraint in how long it takes to, to finish a car. Wiring harnesses take a long time install, to install. So we've got these fundamental constraints. But I think the, the sense that I get is just the amount of waste right now in the OODA loop in a large enterprise organization compared to you know, the paths that you've made in the organizations that you've worked with, we're talking about 100x more waste before you actually get to a fundamental constraint, which is that security review is, is not instant. So I think that, you know, and, and in, your, in your Cloud for CEOs publication in the booklet, Adrian, I really obviously really love how you say the organizational structure for this, for understanding and managing the constraints separately to shift from silos and projects to products 
is key because the thing that I've noticed over and over again in the in the data that we've been collecting on value streams and where the constraints are, it'll actually, for example, be different in different parts of the business, right? So yeah. if you don't allow, you were just talking about this, this independence, if you don't have an organizational construct as you do at Amazon for allowing that independence and actually finding the different constraints and the different parts of the organization where one part might be doing safety critical or you know, privacy critical delivery, whereas another part and, and needs a set of controls that the other part doesn't, whereas the other part is, is still trying to hire the next 20 UX designers that they're behind on hiring. And that's their constraint, right? It's, it's this upstream constraint. Yeah. So I think the, you know, I think one of the main things I'm, I'm taking away from this is just for each part of your, the business as a whole, but each part of your business, you need to separately understand for each part of the product portfolio where the constraint is in, in that OODA loop. Yeah, I want to talk a bit about the word business. I finally realized at some point, because people kept saying, well, we're in IT and we're working and then the business is over there and we're doing this for the business or the business wants this or the business wants that. And I finally realized that we don't ever say that at, at Amazon. Mm-hmm. And this is where I kind of this like, okay, we've got DevOps and then we've got it's biz prod DevOps. So it's the thing about those two pizza teams we talk about uh, at AWS isn't that that isn't the development team for some feature that somebody else in somewhere else in the business wanted us to do. It's more like a startup. There's a business owner, it's funded, there's a central group, and you can kind of think of Andy Jassy and a few other people as the general partners in enormous VC fund, Mm -hmm. right? And what they're doing is like, you do your pitch to the fund and they say, you know, we write our PR, you know, working backwards documents and the PRFAQs. You go up to the fund and you say, here's something I'd like to do. And they say, okay. They say yes or no or whatever, but they basically, if they say yes, then what you're getting is, okay, you get like eight headcount or 10 headcount or whatever it is, plus you know, a few million dollars or whatever it is, your seed funding. And then you get to just go away and start trying to build the thing. Right? And that's a seed round. And we do these every project, every product, every service team is kicked off in this way. And every new piece of every service is done this way. And then you come back later the way AWS works, you come back later when you say, okay, we need to go to market now. And it's like the A round, effectively. And this is where pricing and your business plan for how your adoption rate, you know, what's it going to cost to run this thing? Where's the revenue going to come from? Does it need to be profitable early or later? And all of those kinds of things. What are you launching? What are you going to call it? What's your launch vehicle? All that kind of stuff. So that's sort of decided, and that's when it really diverges. Because in the startup world, that's when you start hiring salespeople. Then you're searching for product market fit, all that kind of stuff. With AWS, we have this huge scaled sales force who are just tra- dragging the product out of your hands. So it has to be ready to scale a bit more than a startup, but we don't have the, you have to hire a sales force problem. We have a more of a delivery gate where it says, okay, this is at least ready for preview and we'll have some customers come and use it. And then we start iterating on on finding the product market fit, and that usually in public with a so quite often you see products launched from AWS that are in that early stage, right? We iterate on them and then we kind of okay, this is what we really want to, and we come out with a, a better version. Maybe we'd go GA at that point. So there's a there's a very different model there because the business is this little team. There's a business owner there, they have a headcount and a budget. And there's an aggregation, like a hierarchy of these little businesses form the teams that form the big businesses, uh, the, the air business groups, if you like, at, at AWS. Yeah, and I think I just could not agree more that, that that approach where we hear the business is separate from IT. I mean, that fundamentally goes against the notion of, of product value streams, right? Where each one has to be biz, prod, dev, and ops. And, and I, think, I think there's a history here because IT used to be the thing that did payroll. Yep. Little bits of automation, stuff like that. It's corporate IT. Yeah. And then when products started being built out of IT, it was they were that's where the people that knew how to build those products were. So they would start building the IT components of products. But what we've got now is products are primarily built out of IT. Yeah. And most of the IT going on in an organization is actually the product related stuff. And the corporate IT has now shrunk. Because, you know, you get your payroll done outside. You've got all these built-in services. So there's less and less corporate IT. And Netflix, it was Wi-Fi in the building right. and some HR stuff. Laptops. Uh, making sure your laptop worked. And that, that corporate IT thing is still there. 
But what we've developed over the intervening years is a model where the CIO, who is really in charge of that stuff, like running data centers for that stuff, has got much too big a scope. What we've seen is some organizations blow up their central IT team, the platform teams, and distribute it to the various product teams so that they each have their own chunks of that system, but still have some central platforms. So there's a central platform thing, but it's basically a platform service rather than controlling all of IT and controlling the architecture. Not every CIO wants to have their career is over sort of variation on that's what CIO stands for, right? And so it was very difficult to find CIOs who don't want to build a new data center because that's how their budget gets bigger, right? And so you have to have a very clear idea that your job is to make the company productive and putting responsibility out into the corners of the company is actually the right move. I could not agree more. And I think the the thing that we've seen happen is you know, a function that was a cost center that was meant to, to deal with systems that at best helped the bottom line is now expected to deliver on the top line of the organization as the digital transformation progresses or, or is accelerated. And then just the old ways of thinking, like the cost center mentality of just managing projects or they're actually managing to value and measuring products or the, the point that you just made, which you know, drives me crazy when I see it, which is that the central function controls all architecture for the whole organization, even if you've got software delivery functions within lines of business, right? It's the architecture centrally controlled because it goes completely against everything that you've said on this podcast, which is to allow these things to move faster in a more decoupled way. So I think blowing away those old structures of, you know, the project hierarchy as being the main projects and costs being the, the main way of measuring value to product value streams and low latency or good flow time as measuring whether you actually are improving, finding those constraints, and then seeing those turn into business results. So. You see, so then there's an additional problem because there's a, now there's a group of enterprise architects who are going like, hey, what happened to my job? Yep. And you're like, um, go find somebody that hasn't figured this out yet. There's certainly things you can do, but the, I mean, the architect role I had at Netflix wasn't a central control. I was mostly documenting what I saw and trying to encourage the formation of well-trodden paths or six-lane highways through the jungle, and also trying to accumulate the experience of the people who are hacking their own paths through the jungle with machetes, right? So this sort of mental image of some teams were just trying to find their own way, and other teams were creating well-trodden paths that other people could just follow. And I was mostly trying to document and coordinate it and provide overall guidance, right? So this is where you get to architectures as being guardrail-based architectures. And this is kind Mm -hmm. of the current terminology people are using. So I don't care what language you wrote it in or what tooling you're using, as long as it's scalable, available, secure, and safe. Versioned, ideally. Right. And there's some efficiency in there. but, But basically, if it doesn't scale, then it's no good. If it's not safe, Safety matters to some companies, not others. Depends you know, if you're in mining, safety is a huge deal, right? It's mostly around um, security, but you have to conform to those things. But I don't care what language you write it in or which libraries you use. If you're trying to coordinate across teams, it's APIs. There should be a reference client for every API, but I don't, shouldn't really care what language you wrote that reference client in. Somebody else might need to clone it into a different language or something. But there's a kind of idea here that... You've decoupled the business enough that you can move independently. Yeah. That's the fundamental piece. Yeah, and I think for some, I'm sure some people listening to this, like getting to what you just what you describe as a reasonable state is is just seems like such a long journey. I just can't emphasize your message more of using flow time or or latency as your guide to that, because it will help you make those decisions that we're way under investing in architecture or or it's way too centralized. Because of course the delivery teams will know that, right? They are trying, they they get a sense for how to innovate, how to use the latest services from AWS, how to A-B test. And I I really think the the challenge is getting leadership and especially senior leadership to understand the value of investing in what you're talking about, which is this software architecture, microservice architecture, data architecture, and in the end, an organizational architecture switch to product and innovation. So So one of the problems I see is a new CEO comes in, a new CIO or new, new leadership comes into an organization, and they see a big mess of randomly different things. And they have a natural inclination to clean it up and to centralize and say, we're just going to, you know, there's a big mess of here and we've got all this stuff and we've got every product from every vendor scattered across data centers and we've got all this stuff scattered across clouds and all these things. And don't 
throw out the baby with the bathwater or whatever, right? The analogy is you you can over centralize and constrain your ability. And if you if you try to come up with the best architecture, it may be better than most of what you've got, but you're also stopping your ability to evolve. So what we want to optimize for is the ability to evolve, the ability to adopt new ideas. Tomorrow, a fantastic new open source project might be released that is exactly what you need. Like how long is it going to take you to jump on board that, figure it out, help whoever built it, make it work perfectly for what you want to do. Right? That was the mentality. Like Netflix picked up Cassandra when it was a really new, immature project and drove a lot of the hardening of it for it to be a major thing. And Apple picked it up, a bunch of other people picked it up. So there's a number of very large sites doing an extremely big Cassandra footprint. But it came from picking up something that says, this is the nearest thing, it solves a problem, we can jump on it and we can take it to be a key piece of our architecture. One of the things that we've learned, I know, internally is that we will actually allow different product value streams to experiment with different technology that makes them more productive, different tools and so on. Is this something you do, whereas the central line mindset is completely opposite? We have to have one stack, one set of architecture documents we follow and so on. Is this something that at Amazon, where are you with Amazon? Is it, are you allowing that independence for product value streams for technology or not? There is quite a bit of diversity. I mean, there's this, there is the six-lane highway, right? Most AWS, most AWS projects run on the same core systems, but they choose to, and they can do different things. And quite a few are doing stuff that is so wildly different that they are doing different things, right? You know, we're getting more projects written in. I mean, the core language we have is mostly Java, but we have more and more projects coming up using Rust. So yep. Firecracker, which is a Rust VMM. Yep. I'm not quite sure how that fits into the standard service deployment process. I guess it somehow does, right? But it's a different thing. And that team went and built Firecracker and they built it with their own kind of tooling around it. So there's mm -hmm. more open source tooling. So there is, you know, we have our own internal systems for doing things at scale and volume and very, you know, with all of that handholding. And we're gradually adopting some of the more open source or more general purpose solutions that are out there. Because kind of, this is a problem, basically, Amazon as a whole automated a whole bunch of stuff very early when there weren't solutions out there, and then got to such large scale that most of the solutions you could buy didn't work. So they ended up in their own path. And this is something that Netflix was worried about as well. And this is one reason we open sourced a lot of the Netflix architecture, was because we didn't want to end up in a dead end of our own making. So we wanted to, a bunch of people to fast follow. So the Spring Cloud adopted a lot of Netflix OSS. If using Spring Cloud, there's just all kinds of Netflix stuff scattered through it. Netflix adopted Spring Cloud in return, and that ended up as a useful way to take a lot of the software architecture and make it for cloud and make it more. Thank you. We use general. it internally too, so thank you for that. Yeah. And you know, Netflix has moved on from some of those pieces, but it's one of the worries you have if, if you're early into a technology is, is, is your dead end, yeah. and other people will pick something else. So... Open source is a good way of testing out those things and sharing what you're doing is a good way. So there's a sense that within Amazon, we're, we're gradually adopting more open source technologies and we're bringing in more. Because when we hire people, they, they don't know how to use any of the internal tooling. It's a pain, right? So we're moving to more common tooling. And some teams are completely running on Kubernetes development organization is basically running on GitHub and just all the modern stuff, right? with some internal release processes wrapped around it. And other teams are just stuck in the core AWS Amazon development environment where we build stuff in a very particular way. It's a huge organization. We're all over the place. But it's not centrally controlled because the whole point about the way AWS in particular is built is we don't want to be over-centralized because that will slow us down. And we're trying to build a scalable engineering organization. And so yeah, and I think it's going well. back to the this this theme you keep saying of the, the decentralization and allowing the the various product value streams to actually make their own decisions and be responsible for their own latency mm -hmm. for their own delivery their um, own roadmaps so. yeah teams own the own service teams own the run roadmaps yeah exactly exactly and, and so you end up i have my cap theorem analogy for aws product line if you'd like to hear that so cap theorem is that yeah the database is right if you you can if when you partition a database, it's either going to be consistent or available, right? You've got yeah. your two choices, right? So the problem we have at AWS is that since we have a partition development process, it cannot be consistent. 
So what we have is a highly available set of services mm -hmm. in terms of the features are available yeah. to you, but those features are not consistent. Yeah. So if we added a second, if we added a consistency enforcement mechanism at centralized at AWS, like a governance process that then said all APIs would must conform to this yeah. way of working, it would slow us down. We'd yeah. have a more consistent, but you'd get less availability of new features. So, yeah. so we have to marketing and we have to sort of patch up the fact that not all of the AWS products completely work with each other or are clean in the integrations. And you have to kind of go, well, I got it sooner. Yeah. So that's the good. Just go with the fact you got it sooner and we will eventually make it consistent where it needs to be. So complain back at us about anything that doesn't work with something else. Don't just say, oh, this didn't work for me. Just make sure you find a product feature request or one of the public roadmaps and just plus one and escalate because that's the feedback mechanism we use to get to the consistency that we know you need for a whole building a whole solution, right? But anyway, it's kind of a... It's one of the challenges. It's, it's kind of the hard part of, of AWS. The features sort of come at you so fast that you can't keep up. And then this thing and this thing, sometimes they work together. Sometimes we didn't think of that or we haven't had a customer complain about it yet. But at least you know what you're, you're optimizing for the constraint that you want to minimize, right? So, yeah. so it's we have more and more, interestingly, we have more roadmaps on GitHub. So the, the container roadmap is entirely on GitHub. If you want something, you go look at the roadmap and you say, yeah, someone else asked for that. And then we have a, there's like a Kanban. It basically moves forward. So it goes to like, you know, ideas that people have submitted to we're working on it to coming soon to, hey, we just released this thing, right? Yeah. And you can track your idea going through. And yeah. more teams are starting to use that as a mechanism for gathering, just, just accumulating customer feedback, for, yeah. particularly for the open source based products. Yeah, I, that's exactly where, where I came from as well, right? Where the, the roadmaps themselves were these structured community artifacts that were yeah. open and open yeah. source. Adrian, we are at time. This has been amazing. And I think that's just such great advice and kind of, you know, painting the picture of where, where organizations need to end up and then some very concrete ways that you can think about getting there. So any, any other final words for the audience? I mean, just to reiterate, I'd concentrate on, on a couple of things. One is you know, time to value or flow time. The other one is utilization. And once you get to a reasonably sized organization in terms of your cloud footprint, it's worth hire, starting to build a central performance team who will focus on finding the most inefficient part of your environment. You know, they'll go in and tune it. The next month, your bill will be less. It's the elasticity. And they'll increase utilization, they'll right-size things, they'll tune the code, whatever it takes. But that team will pay for itself. I mean, you have to be at enough scale, you know, that if your cloud bill is smaller than how much you're spending on coffee, then you don't need this, right? And at some point you go and hire, you know, a consultant, so you have a, somebody from ProServe come in to help you. But once you get to a decent scale, these teams are invaluable. They speed things up, they reduce waste, and they should be centralized and they should be sort of lend an engineer out to the remote team that's wh whoever's running the most inefficient piece of the system, right? Lend them an engineer for a week and come back. And then you can just look at how many, whatever, millions of dollars per engineer you're saving. And then you figure out how, much, how many more people you want to hire. What's your ROI on that team? Because it's a very clear win. A lot of that is about getting the elasticity. And we've seen that recently and there are huge variations in customer demand particularly through the pandemic. And we've seen some customers really scale up very effectively and scale down very effectively. And that's been very good for their business. So they've really learned the value of cloud from the elasticity and the ability to have a variable cost on, on their infrastructure. And that's been a very helpful capability. So that's sort of light bulbs going off because if you're stuck in a data center investment, you go, like, I might need some more capacity for a few months. It's like, I don't want to go put it in a three-year depreciation model. I'm locking myself into something that really should be a variable cost. We're getting a, and some interesting new fans for, for cloud out of the whole, the fact that we're getting very disruption, a lot of disruption right now. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And those companies that did do it effectively and that actually can bring their costs down through this as well and then scale up as they need. Are so the elasticity is, is really yeah. important. So that's basically it. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Adrian. I, I do recommend everyone check out Cloud for CEOs, Measure Innovation with One Metric, uh, Adrian's publication that you can just Google for and download. And thank you again, Adrian. Where can people find you if they want to learn more? Adrian CO on Twitter. You don't have to try and spell my surname correctly. 
And I'm on dev.to. I've started posting things on there or on Medium, a few random things there, and various online conferences. <laughs> yeah, that's where we now meet. So. And if, right, you're, if you're an AWS customer and you want to have a more detailed conversation, you know, contact through your sales team and call me and I, I spend quite a lot of time in customer meetings. So happy to do that. Excellent. We'll wrap there. And you know where to find Adrian. And thank you so much again for sharing your wisdom and some very concrete, concrete advice on how to move ahead. So, Okay. Thank you. Cheers. A huge thank you to Adrian for joining me on this episode. For more, follow me and my journey on LinkedIn, Twitter, or by using the hashtags Mic plus one or project to product. You can find Adrian on Twitter and Medium by searching at Adrian Co. I have a new episode every two weeks, so hit subscribe to join us again. You can also search for Project to Product to get the book. And remember that all of the proceeds go to supporting women and minorities in technology. Thanks, stay safe, and until next time.